This is Bill Leonard at Fort Amsterdam, main defensive fortification on the southern tip of Manhattan Island. Here on this first day of September 1664, the little Dutch colony of New Netherlands faces its most critical hour. The English fleet is on the move. From where we are set up, high on the parapet of the fort, we can just about make out two of their ships. They appear to be through the narrows well into New Amsterdam Harbor headed upstream toward New Amsterdam under full sail and stripped for action. This village of New Amsterdam is in ferment. The question here, the unanswered question of the hour, is whether or not the Dutch governor, His Excellency Peter Stuyvesant, will accept the ultimatum of surrender delivered early this morning in a letter by a representative of the English commander-in-chief, Colonel Richard Nichols. Should the governor refuse to surrender Manhattan Island and all of the Dutch colony of New Netherlands, then within moments, we may see this peaceful community of 1,500 souls turned into a battlefield. See the bowries and homes of these peace-loving burghers ripped and torn by the might of English cannon. It's just eight in the morning here in New Amsterdam. A light haze that hung over the bay, the top and zay all morning, has just lifted. And it gives promise of being a hot and humid day. From where we stand, the town looks deserted. Many people, under orders of Governor Peter Stuyvesant, are gathered at the northern... September 30, 1664. The English demand the surrender of New Amsterdam. You are there. English men of war sail into the harbor of New Amsterdam, and Governor Peter Stuyvesant must make his choice between surrender and war. CBS takes you back 286 years to the decisive hour in the struggle of the Dutch to maintain their colonial empire on the mainland of North America. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. With all the modern facilities of radio present and CBS newsmen reporting from the scene, You Are There! You Are There! is based on historical fact and quotation. And now... 1664. Port Amsterdam at the southern tip of Manhattan Island and Bill Leonard. Now to make out the two English frigates quite clearly. At the moment, they're quite a bit below Newton's or Governor's Island, as it's more commonly called, and they're pressing forward toward our position here at Port Amsterdam. The intention of the English is quite evident. Once these English ships sail past the fort here, if they can get beyond the fort, they can proceed up Hudson's River and take up their position anywhere along the exposed western flank of Manhattan Island. The only other point of defense here at New Amsterdam Island is along Het Single, where a wooden wall stretches from river to river about half a mile north of the fort. At this moment, while Governor Stuyvesant and his council are debating the English ultimatum in the government house here inside the fort, across town on the East River, a meeting of prominent citizens is in session in the Stadthuis, the town hall. A large body of workers on Het Single is reinforcing that position. Don Hollenbeck is up there with them. We take you now to Het Single, the street this side of the wall, and Don Hollenbeck. Here on Het Single, an attempt is being made to repair the breastworks against the threatening invasion by English troops from the north. Five days ago, on the first appearance of the English fleet off Coney Island, Governor Stuyvesant issued an order to strengthen this barricade. It's actually nothing more than a wooden palisade that stretches across Manhattan Island. His order stated that all able-bodied men were to work in the shifts on this project. Now, supervised by a company of Stuyvesant's troops, the burghers here are slowly putting up new palisades. A few, a very few of them, are carrying timber. Some are digging post holes. But the most of the men are gathered in the shade of a grove of trees. They're smoking their long clay pipes. And despite the fact that they know of the approach of the English men of war, no one seems to have his heart in this project. There's a good deal of muttering and grumbling. The people seem sullen and discouraged. The only talk you hear, all the talk you hear, centers on the letter. The letter. Somehow, for some reason, there seems to be a strong feeling here that the letter delivered to Governor Stuyvesant this morning by the English envoy Governor John Winthrop of Connecticut contains very easy, very desirable, very attractive terms. If Stuyvesant surrenders New Amsterdam to the English without a fight. 
Certainly the people here seem more interested in the contents of that letter than they are in preparing the defense of their town against the English. There's a lot of speculation, too, about the meeting of the prominent citizens of New Amsterdam now taking place at Stadthuis, the traditional meeting place of the Burgomasters. For the latest developments on that point, we take you cross town now to Stadthuis on the East River and Douglas Edwards. The clerk will read the next paragraph. We shall now examine the news here, the big sports. news, is that the citizens' you know meeting in the main the room of the town hall the has just reached unanimous Ladies agreement to I petition Governor Stuyvesant to surrender the colony to the Your English. In this petition. It places us in the position of bond servants begging mercy of some lord. We are free As you probably hear, a remonstrance, a petition, is now being debated. Even in it's being drawn up uh, by all those in the hall. When the wording of this remonstrance is finally agreed on, a committee will be appointed to present the document to Governor Stuyvesant. A demand will also be made upon the governor to make public the contents of the letter. We interrupt Doug Edwards to bring you the news that the English have landed in Brooklyn. I repeat, the English have landed in Brooklyn. A dispatch has just been received here telling us that a force of English soldiers from Colonel Nichols' fleet, estimated at between two and, and, and 500 men, has been put ashore close to the settlement of Brooklyn across the East River from us here in Manhattan. The report states that they are now marching northward to make contact with another English force on Long Island. The developing military situation is now becoming quite clear. Colonel Nichols is tightening a noose around Manhattan Island while... As we have reported, two of his heavily armed frigates are at this very moment speeding up the harbor toward the tip of Manhattan Island, presumably intending to attack Fort Amsterdam. And uh, both frigates are clearly in sight now. They carry some 66 guns between them, while here at the fort the Dutch have only 24 guns, brass six-pounders. We'll get back to Doug Edwards at Stadthuis a little later, but now, now we take you to the governor's chambers here in the fort and Ned Calmer. We're speaking to you from the anteroom right outside the council chambers where Governor Stuyvesant is meeting with his advisors. Word has just come out that His Excellency will have a statement for us in a very few minutes. Dispatch carriers have been dashing in and out of the council room all morning. News of the English landing in Brooklyn, of the protest meeting of citizens at Stadthuis, is already in the governor's hands, and no doubt his statement will clarify his own position in this grave emergency. We must realize that what is happening at this moment here in the New World may well be the climax of an all-out struggle between two great European empires for supremacy. The English, of course, based their claim to New Netherlands on Cabot's discovery of the North American mainland in 1498. And they maintain that all this land rightfully belongs within the patent granted to the London and Plymouth companies by the English king in 1607, 57 years ago. The Dutch, on the other hand, point out that the actual discoverer of New Amsterdam Harbor, Henry Hudson, was sailing under the Dutch flag, that they were the first to occupy the territory, and possibly their most cogent argument, that they are here and the English are not. Charles II, just this year, March 1664, decided to press the English claim. He granted all the land between the west bank of the Connecticut River and the east bank of Delaware Bay to his brother James, the Duke of York and Albany. And Colonel Nichols is under express orders from the Duke to take over the colony with force of arms, if need be, at... His Excellency, the Governor, Peter Stuyvesant, has just come out of the Council Chamber. He's stopped to talk with the Commander of the Guard. Now, the other members of the Council are filing out of the Chamber now, and they look worn and grim. The Governor himself, however, shows no sign of weariness. His whole figure seems to flash defiance. He's a man of average height, but solidly built. He's wearing breast armor, a doeskin cloak, a brilliant red sash around his waist. And, of course, the most striking feature of all, the famous silver leg, his hallmark. You'll recall he lost his left leg in the fight against the Portuguese when he was governor of the Dutch colony of Curaçao in the West Indies. I'm going to try to get him to speak to us now. Your Excellency, sir, we understand that you wish to make a statement to the people of New Amsterdam. Yes, and what I have to say is particularly meant for the commander of the English forces now illegally present in our province. Yes. We 
the people of New Netherland came not into this province by any violence, but by virtue of a commission from the States General of the Netherlands, granted in the years 1614, 1615, and 1616. We came peaceably. We settled peaceably. And we have been good neighbors. Now you come and demand of us our homes, our property, that which labor and sacrifice has given us. We will not give them up. In case you will act by force of arms, we protest before God and man that you will perform an act of unjust violence. As regards your threats, we have no answer to make. Only that we fear nothing but what God may lay upon us. All things are at his disposal. And we can be preserved by him with small forces as well as by a great army. This is our last word. We will not surrender. We will not surrender. Just one question, please. What about the letter you received from Governor Winthrop? Could you tell us what was in that letter? I will not profane my lips or the ears of the good burghers of New New Netherlands by repeating its treacherous contents. Here's the letter, and here's what it serves to be done. The governor has torn the letter into shreds, we torn it apart. Surrender. The governor has unequivocally refused to surrender to the English. He has rejected their ultimatum. He has torn up the letter delivered by Governor Winthrop, the letter about which there has been so much speculation. And now it lies in bits on the floor. Almost certainly, this will mean war. And now back up to the parapet of Fort Amsterdam and Bill Leonard. The English men of war are now just below Governor's Island, not within range yet, but they've crowded on extra canvas. On both frigates, battle pennants can be seen from here, whipping in the breeze. It seems almost only an adverse wind and the strong currents in the bay are slowing their progress, but but minute by minute, they're, they're looming larger. They're pressing forward towards Manhattan Island, toward our positions here on Fort Amsterdam. No telling just when the English frigates will move into range, perhaps... Perhaps, oh, I don't know, ten minutes, perhaps more, we're standing by. In the meantime, there have been further developments at Stout House, so we return you once again to Doug Edwards. Trouble is brewing here at Stout House. Up to now, these good burghers were anxious, worried, but in their usual stolid Dutch manner, they kept their feelings to themselves. But now the picture has suddenly changed. Now that they have learned that Governor Stuyvesant has torn up the letter from the English commander, these people are angry. Their faces and manners show that they are exasperated with the action of the governor. We are now in the corridor outside the hall where the meeting of prominent citizens continues. The wording of the remonstrance to Stuyvesant has been agreed upon, and, well, at the moment, it's in the process of being signed by those present in the hall inside. It may be that the crowd here will attempt no overt act until the meeting is concluded or entirely possible any moment may bring the spark that will ignite the temper of the people. And, well, what will happen from that point on is, well, it's anybody's guess, but it won't be pretty and it won't be pleasant. I have here at the microphone with me now a typical citizen of New Amsterdam. His views, I think, will be interesting. May we have your name, sir? My name is Nicholas Meyer. What business are you in, sir? Uh, I am a free merchant. I I trade in furs. My shop is just in the next street, Hook Street. Well, what's your feeling about all that's happening, Mr. Meyer? Mm, Well, my feeling... My attitude is... He thinks uh, old Civil Leg is a murderer, and all of us think so, too. Uh, this is my wife. She means Governor Stuyvesant. Uh, yes, high-mindedness. The governor, Peter Stuyvesant. What does he care about us, about the people? What does he care? Oh, he'll fight. Yes, he'll fight. When the English cannons are blowing up our homes and killing us, he'll be safe in the fort. Last night, Nicholas, my husband, he told me it's not fighting if we try and stop the English. It's suicide. Uh, yes, I said He that... said, why should we fight the English? What kind of business is it to fight your customers? That's what you said, Nicholas. I said that, yes. Oh, you say the English are your best cup. You say the English are your best cup. You say the English are your best cup. You say the English are your best customers. But isn't it illegal to trade with the English here? Well, yes, but... It is illegal, but everybody does it. The governor says we must not trade with the English. 
We must ship all our goods first to Holland on Dutch ships and pay you. You are five percent duty. So what do we do? What would you do? Oh, smuggle. We're all honest people and we smuggle. We want to have enough to live, we smuggle. We have to smuggle. When the English come, then we'll not have to smuggle. We can trade like honest people. All we want is trade, and the English offer us trade. So why should we fight the English? We cannot fight even if we want to. Well, you believe, Mr. Meyer, there's no hope in defending the city? No, I... In all New Amsterdam, there's only 975 shekels of grain left. 975 shekels? Yes. What about the water shortage? Only three wells in the whole town, and two of them almost dry. And that's not all. Nicholas. Tell me what you told me about the powder for the cannon in the fort. Uh, yes, I, I have been told from someone who knows that... That old uh, silver egg wastes so much gunpowder firing salutes every time the English send a messenger that now there's hardly enough powder left to put up a good battle. Is the truth, Nicholas? Is the truth. Well, thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Meyer. I, I'm sorry, we'd like to hear more, but Don Hollenbeck at Hetzingel has something to report. Come in, Don Hollenbeck. All work has stopped on the wall. The people have thrown down their tools. They're defying the soldiers, and now in a mass, they are marching toward Fort Amsterdam. The soldiers, too, are beating a quick retreat. They've left this entire northern boundary of the town unprotected. They're heading for the fort as well. To get behind the walls to find some protection, some cover from the English bombardment, which is expected to start at any moment. I'm practically deserted here now, so back to Douglas Edwards at Stathuis. I'm speaking now from outside the town hall. The meeting of burghers in Stathuis is over. The hall is emptying. Everybody, the crowd which was gathered outside and those who were in the hall, everybody is headed down Bruce Street towards Fort Amsterdam. A delegation of three has been appointed to present Governor Stuyvesant with a remonstrance or petition signed by 94 of the most prominent citizens in New Amsterdam. The delegation, which is already on its way to the fort, is made up of the two leading clergymen of the town, Dominic Magapolensis and his son, and Olaf Stevenson van Cortland, former burgomaster of New Amsterdam and one of its most respected citizens. Most of the burghers have made their way out of the Stathuis by now. There, uh, well, one moment, please. Uh, may we have a word, please? Just a word. This is CBS. Uh, this is Mr. Balthazar Stuyvesant, the son of Governor Stuyvesant, and who's just come out of the Stathuis. Uh, Mr. Stuyvesant, you attended the meeting. You were inside. Yes. Well, may we ask your personal attitude on the remonstrance? I, I should like to point out, if I may, that while His Excellency the Governor is my father, I... I am in my own right a citizen of New Amsterdam. I have certain filial obligation to my father, which I have always tried to fulfill. But on the other hand, I have deep and serious obligations to my neighbors, my fellow citizens of New Amsterdam. This, all of this has placed me in a most difficult position. Well, we understand that, sir. But... To answer your question, yes, I signed the remonstrance. And now, please, I must go. Well, thank you, sir. That was Mr. Balthasar Stuyvesant, the governor's son. He has joined with the other leading citizens of the town in an appeal to his father to avoid war, to surrender the town to the English. This crowd now is rapidly thinning out. Almost everyone is headed toward the fort. Bill Leonard, up on the parapet of Fort Amsterdam, can you see the crowd coming? They're headed down Bruce Street. Come in, Bill Leonard. Yes, 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 we can just see them coming, Doug. Not only the crowd from Stathuis, but the men who are working on the northern wall. They're coming this way, too. They're coming down the Hervek, the long highway. From there, from Bruce Street, it seems from every street that leads toward us here at Fort Amsterdam. From every street, the burghers are converging on the fort. We can see that many of them have already gathered on the Markvel just outside the fort. Even from this distance, we, we can hear their angry roar, but... But right here, right on the rampart of Fort Amsterdam, the soldiers, the officers, are not looking toward them. They're looking out into the bay toward those two English frigates, which now are only minutes away from coming into cannon range. All eyes are on the snouts of those cannon, which can be seen peering through the portholes on the sides of the men of war from stem to stern, believe me. Governor Stuyvesant is standing right across from me between two of his 24 brass cannon, six-pounders. He has... One hand on the hilt of his sword, he holds his cane in the other. 
He's given no sign of even noticing the presence of the crowd below. He seems determined to fight with or without the support of the people he's going to resist. Ned Calmer has moved from his position at the governor's council chamber and is now in the middle of the demonstration outside the fort. All right, uh, come in, Ned Calmer. The crowd here is almost completely out of hand. A few guards before the fort are trying to hold them back, but the crowd is pressing forward, trying to push the soldiers out of the way and shouting and cursing. The delegation of citizens with the remonstrance to Governor Stuyvesant is fighting its way through the crowd. They're trying to get to the entrance of the fort. Some of the younger men are clearing away for them, trying to make a pass. And they've just about reached the gate of the fort. Pastor Megapolensis, the leader of the delegation, has turned toward the people. Now he's holding up his hand, trying to get them quiet. We're up as close as we can possibly get. He's trying to speak. We hope we can pick him up. Quiet! Go home! All of you, go home! Get your families to safety. Get into the cellars. Find cover if you can. Where's old Silver Lake? Make him come out. No! No, listen! As the Apostle Paul hath said, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And he hath said too, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. Go home. Compound no further evils here. Your delegation is prepared to offer the remonstrance to His Excellency. It will be heard. No human heart is so base that it cannot be moved by the cries of women, of helpless children. Go home and pray. Someone has just come out of the fort. I can't make out who it is. I don't it's know... It's Nicholas Bayard. It's Nicholas Bayard, one of the governor's counselors. He's whispering something now to the dominie. There. Quiet! Listen, listen to me. Quiet! Listen. We have the letter. We have the letter. It was pieced together by Nicholas Bayard. Do you want to hear the letter? Yeah. Nicholas Bayard, a member of the governor's council, evidently was able to piece together fragments of the letter, which Governor Stuyvesant, you remember, had torn up. And now he's going to read it, I think he... The letter from the English commander says, I do assure you that if Manhattan be delivered up to his majesty, I shall not hinder but any people from the Netherlands may freely come and plant there or thereabouts. The English promise not to stop any Dutch settlers from coming to the colony. Any, any vessels of their own country may freely come thither. Ships from the Netherlands will be free to enter the port. Any, any of them may as freely return home in vessels of their own country. And this and much more is contained in the privilege of His Majesty's English subjects. The English commander guarantees them all the rights and privileges of English subjects. In other words, they'll be free to trade with the English. Their property won't be confiscated. But the people here are demanding to see Stuyvesant. No. And if they get into the fort, anything can happen. They're pressing forward. The dominie is trying desperately to stop them. Listen. He's trying to speak again. Listen, don't go inside the fort. Don't try to go into the fort. The guns will be turned upon you. In the name of heaven, don't go into the fort. Wait. Wait for the time. and his delegation have gone into the fort. The gate has slammed shut on the crowd. The soldiers are barring the way, but the people are still trying to press forward. They're being held back for the moment anyway. Bill Leonard is up there on the parapet, so over to Bill Leonard. The English men of war are past Governor's Island. The Dutch gunners here on the parapet of the fort are at their posts, flaming torches in their hands. And everyone is waiting tensely for the order from Governor Stuyvesant to commence firing. The governor himself is standing next to his captain of artillery. He's peering out at the bay, watching the oncoming English frigates and 
waiting for them finally to come into range. He hears the roar of the people outside the fort, the cries of those people. He's making no sign of giving in to them. He's a picture of determination, defiance as he's standing there. His breast armor gleaming, silver filigree on his wooden leg. I can see sparkling in the sun. And now up the stairs to the parapet, I can see the dominie leading his delegation. They're coming right toward us, toward the governor. The elderly clergyman is breathing heavily, but he's gone directly to the side of the governor. We're as close as we can get to them. Now the governor is turned to Well, Well, Dominey, are you here to bless our venture? Will you lead these brave soldiers in prayer? Well, sir, uh, I, 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 I beg you, Your Excellency, in the name of heaven, do not wet your hands with the blood of the innocent. They're crying to you. Cannon, not tears, will save this colony. No, I, I, I ask you, sir, in the name of humanity, listen to the earnest petition of the people. Hear their remonstrance. You, you must listen. Domini Megapolensis is right. taking out a scroll Honorable. of paper. The governor we, turns his back on him. He's looking out toward the bay again, toward the English frigates. The clergyman is reading the remonstrance. In sad circumstances that we cannot foresee for this fort and city of Manhattan... In further resistance, aught else than misery, sorrow, and conflagration. The dishonor of women, the murder of children, Captain and in a word, the absolute ruin of 1,500 innocent souls. On all sides, we are encompassed and hemmed in by our enemies. Wherefore, we humbly and in bitterness of heart implore your honor not to reject the conditions of so generous a foe. Otherwise, we are obliged to call down upon your honor the vengeance of heaven for all the innocent blood which shall be shed in consequence of your honor's obstinacy. We, the burghers of New Amsterdam, feel certain that your honor will conclude, with God's help, an honorable and reasonable capitulation. Governor Peter Stuyvesant is still looking out toward the English warships, which are now sweeping directly under the guns of the fort. But he has not yet given the order to fire. He, he just stands there watching like a statue without moving a muscle. Now, now, Domini, Megapolensis and his son go up to place his arm around Stuyvesant's shoulder. And now, now he's leading him away from the cannon. Oh. I would rather be carried a corpse to my grave than to surrender this city. But I will. I will. The governor will not give the order to fire. He will not offer resistance to the English. He turns, is walking slowly away. He's, he's giving up the obviously untenable military situation. The manifest refusal of the Dutch people to defend their town must have forced Governor Stuyvesant to make this reluctant and this bitter decision. Now a white flag has been hoisted over the fort. New Amsterdam has surrendered to the English. Without a fight, without a cannon fired, without a drop of blood being shed, New Amsterdam is surrendering to the English. The people have won out. Stuyvesant has bowed before the will of the people. He's done what he swore he would never do, give up the city without a fight, without a battle. But now, now it's all over. It's done. The English frigates have swept by the fort. They're beyond the fort. September 1st, 1664. The Dutch surrender to the English and New Amsterdam becomes New York. You are there. You have been listening to The Surrender of New Amsterdam in the series You Are There. Today's program was written by Irv Tunick, directed by John Dietz, and produced by the CBS Documentary Unit under the supervision of Werner Michel. Peter Stuyvesant was played by Barry Kroger. Everett Sloan was Dominey Macapolensis. Robert Dryden was Nicholas Bayard. And Irene Hubbard was Mrs. Mayer. Others in the cast included Jack Lloyd and Burke Colan. You Are There is brought to you every fourth Sunday. The next broadcast will be heard Sunday, February 19th, but at a new time at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time over most of these same stations. Next month, at the new time, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. October 25th.
1854, Balaclava in the Crimea, the charge of the Light Brigade. You are there. CBS will bring you the earth-shaking premiere of a new opera tonight, an opera written by Alec Templeton, with Charlie McCarthy as a lovelorn singing Bengal Lancer. Templeton himself.